it's really thinking of the world is confusing and messed up in many ways. So it's how can we use the disciplines and the tools and the community that we built to do something of purpose. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers and this is Clever. Today I'm talking to Rob Forbes. Rob Forbes has been a professional ceramicist, author, business entrepreneur, photographer, and public speaker. He's best known, however, as the founder of Design Within Reach. He also founded Public Bikes, and he's been an outspoken advocate for modern design. Recently, in 2021, Rob founded Studio 5050, an organization with a mission to mentor and assist small businesses owned and run by people of color. He's based in Northern California, where he also operates a micro farm. Here's Rob. Rob Forbes, I live in San Francisco, and I have a number of different areas that, that I work in that involve consulting and board work and writing. So it's a mixed bag, and I have a little micro farm up in Healdsburg. Micro farm, that's going to be interesting to talk about. But before we get to that, let's go all the way back to the farm you grew up on, which I understand was uh, Pasadena and Laguna Beach area in California. Not really a farm. <laughs> not, not really a farm. No, we had a, a kind of a pets menagerie with my mom in South Pasadena. And my dad lived in Altadena, but and also had a house down in Laguna Beach. What can you tell me about your formative years? Probably my parents. My mom was a Irish feminist uh, literature teacher and uh, used to force me to write poetry in the morning. But she came from a culture where arts were probably considered the highest achievement of, of mankind, but this included literature, theater, and music and all that. But she very much um, loved the cultural expressions and the wide view of arts. And my dad was also a college prof and surrounded himself by a lot of colleagues who were in arts and in the liberal areas. My dad had a kind of mid-century house in Altadena. It was like your typical middle-class Southern California upbringing in the 50s and 60s. And what did your dad teach? He was a professor of education. He wanted to be a journalist, but at that time, the college system was growing like mad, and they just needed people who could basically help teach people to learn how to teach. And my mom was a literature professor in college. So it sounds like the arts were supported, also academia. Both of my folks come from that li really broad liberal arts program. Maybe there was a divorce. Is that why you were toggling back and forth between the two houses? Yeah, my parents divorced when I was at a young age. You know, they weren't hardcore academics, but they just believed that thinking and expressing yourself was a really important part of existence. Did you have siblings? I have one older brother. I never had a, a split household, but I'm always curious what that does when you have two distinct worlds that are interwoven but separate that you toggle between? I think it's a long story behind it because I said my, my mom being a hardcore Irish feminist character and my dad being your even killed, easy to get along with type of person and, and, and our households reflected that character also. <laughs> okay. So I, I think when you're a kid and you're toggling between two different residences and two different environments and two different people who didn't speak with each other, you receive things in a different way. You don't really have a home if you're kind of trying to figure it out in two different environments and, and two different influences. Well, you know, I usually ask about teenage years and if you felt like you needed to rebel. And in this particular case, I'm interested in if you did rebel, did you rebel differently against different parents and have a kind of a different need to individuate from each of them? I don't think so, but I was shipped off to a boarding school and we were just middle class kids and no one went to boarding schools, but my mom shipped us off. And so I had, hadn't lived at home from the time I was 14. By nature, I didn't have to rebel. I was trying to figure out my own life as an independent young teen and spent my summers living with friends, parents down in Laguna and um, really conducting an independent life as a young person. Did you feel like you had to grow up fast? If you're a kid, you're just surviving. And, and you feel very proud about that. And I think probably the independent nature of my mom being a, like a single woman in the 50s and 60s, which wasn't so common back then, gave me the kind of understanding that you can do a lot of stuff on your own, that, that sense of, of freedom. I remember going to boarding school, and I was a super academic kid. I wasn't an artist. I wasn't a designer. I loved math and English and sports. And, and I think that I probably established when I went off to boarding school with a bunch of rich kids that came from different kinds of backgrounds, 
I, I worked really hard to excel in the different things that people normally hope their kids excel in, you know, being good at school and being sports. But I was a pretty typical competitive kind of kid that way. Where was the sporting school? This is in the San Ynez Valley, which is now a bucolic wine producing area just up and back of Santa Barbara. So still West Coast. I should say also I went to this boys school and then for different reasons left. In my senior year, I went to a co-ed boarding school up in back up in San Francisco area that was a completely different experience. <laughs> from a boys school to a co-ed school, that does change things. And up near San Francisco, so that's from bucolic to cosmopolitan. It's out in the in back of the East Bay in a developing kind of area. But the most interesting thing about that was this was a school that was 50-50 boys and girls. 10% of the students were minorities from Oakland, super liberal, educated, creative bunch of people who were around. So it was like going from a almost military kind of boarding school into a place where, wow, it's just a, an eclectic group of people who shared my values as being a little bit of an odd kid and really being interested in lots of different things. How did you get from being good at math, English, and sports to studying aesthetics and ceramics in college? Well, I went to college at UC Santa Cruz to study philosophy or literature or something. Don't know what. You went to college to figure out what you were going to do. I just started making ceramics just for fun, just for recreation. And then it turned out that I got pretty good at it. And I was able to make my living. This was countercultural years, like in the 70s. And you could make your living as a weaver or a potter by going to craft shows and selling stuff on, on weekends. Whereas my other friends who were more academic during the summers, what do you do for a job? You work in a restaurant or get some construction job. But I was actually able to make my living selling my own work, which was totally amazing. I mean, it was really like a, a period of time that, that I don't think exists so easily now. Agreed. Was this also your entrepreneurial awakening? Perhaps. I had the advantage. I took a year off and went to Europe and traveled around. It took me like seven years to get through college and then worked for artists, ceramic artists in both France and England. And so I was around people that ran their own ateliers and, and studios. And I think that probably in, encouraged me to sort of, hey, do what you want to do. Or, or well, there was no sense that you'd be working in any type of formal business environment. So there's independence, there's a kind of appreciation for the craft, but also a, a real sort of self-reliance on making it, selling it, making it your life and your ecosystem. What were the kind of formative experiences from that time in your life that you still feel like are informing your, your life today? I, I think this um, obsession with good form and mm -hmm. getting stuff right and the economy associated with a very well done craft. I think the high standards that people have, and it is one of those 10,000 hours to be really good at that stuff, you really need to be disciplined and focused and take yourself quite seriously. When I started DWR years later and became an expert on chairs and, and people, well, where did you develop an eye? And I said, if you make ceramics and do that for 10 years and you got your nose that close to your product, you really develop uh, an appreciation for the nuances and form and detail and, and how important all that stuff is in, ter in terms of creating something that's actually good. Do you believe that in addition to developing your eye, it was also being a maker, of course, helped you appreciate other well-made good form items. But was that one of the reasons why you felt like there was a direct connection between the design and the designer? Absolutely. And working around the people that ran these ateliers, uh, super opinionated, amazing, you know, really <laughs> amazing people. Characters. Yeah. And if you're a kid from Pasadena, it's, oh my God, this is partially super romantic, but then also partially super real. The, the other Part of that, I think, is, again, growing up in Southern California. Over in Europe, living in France or England, where the people that surround you really took things like cooking and gardening and appreciation of traditional architecture and, and history and all that. So you're in the old world. So I think that deep dive into European values and appreciation has stuck with me throughout my life. That makes sense. So we have some gaps to cover. You mentioned founding DWR, and we're going to get there. That was in 1999. But in the 70s, yeah. you're a potter. And then it sounds like traveling around Europe and working with artists and ateliers. W what are the main plot points between then and founding DWR? I went back to graduate school and got an MFA in ceramics, taught at the Cleveland Institute of Art and the Philadelphia College of Art. That was like a four-year period as a you know, practicing artist and a ceramics prof. 
And then I, I just came to a point where I went, no, I was living in Philadelphia and I was hankering to get back to California. But I realized I was no longer as challenged by what I was doing and I just needed a change. What do you do? You know, if you don't have any uh, particular skills, what do you, you go be a lawyer or a doctor or somebody? Uh, a friend of mine had gone to business school and said, you might like that. You're good with numbers and you like solving problems. And so I, I was lucky to get into the, an MBA program at Stanford. So I went back to school, came back to the West Coast, and from there went and worked for different companies like Williams Sonoma. I, I got married and lived in, in London and do it a big startup for a large department store called Selfridges. And I came back to the US and was working for a nature company in Smith and Hawken. But I had a mixed bag specialty retailing training. And the one at Williams Sonoma was really super uh, important to me before I started DWR. And what compelled you to found DWR, which for our listeners is an acronym for Design Within Reach, the direct-to-consumer furniture retailer that you founded that aimed to make good and iconic design more accessible. And at the time, in 1999, that was both by utilizing the internet and, as we just said, by connecting the design to the actual designer behind it. That's my little overview for our listeners so they know where we are. I'm wondering, at what point did you feel like, okay, I need to start a new business around this, and I'm the guy to do it? I'd been working as like a VP of marketing for these specialty retailing companies and was getting a little, whether well, it was bored or just recognized, nah, I don't know, is this, the, is this the life that I want to have? And then I had a year where everything went wrong. My dad's wife died, another friend had died, I bought a house and the contractor went bankrupt. But it was one of those years when I said, you know, life is short, do something that you really care about. And so I took a full year off to research. I had this idea for making design accessible and making it simple. I'd been in Europe where everybody could go and buy design. In the US at that time, you had to go through a design showroom and you had to be an architect or an interior designer. I took a year off and really studied and became an expert in the modern chair and modern furniture, but spent a year testing my ideas and having to raise money. But I took a full year just recognizing that psychically I needed to do something that I really was passionate about. What are the beginning pieces of this and how did you build traction? And at what point did you feel like I'm onto something and this is going to work? Yeah, it was an amazing kind of crapshoot. Our business was, I'm going to curate a bunch of furniture and we're going to sell it directly and you're having to buy inventory. So this means having to raise like a million and a half dollars just to have the stock to have. And I believe this idea of making stuff convenient and simple was really important. But I raised money for that. We produced a catalog. It would be like creating a website today. We didn't quite have websites yet. So you put all your money into it catalog that you, that, that you sent out. I'm good at soliciting opinions from the outside and, and having my own ideas tested, but we launched the catalog just on one day on Bastille Day in 99. And literally from that moment on, it was a tiger by the tail for about five years. It just worked. You know, we'd planned to you know, do a million and a half bucks the first six months. We did six million. The next year we did 12 million. We did 20. But it was really like Surrounded myself by some very talented people. Uh, we had the fastest website in design that exists. Uh, we started publishing this newsletter. We had like 100,000 readers of this newsletter that I authored. Before the word blog was around, this is 10 years before Facebook and Twitter around. It was an innovative form of communication. We were kind of pioneers. Absolutely. And so pioneering this stuff, and now you can see that not only did it work, but it's also kind of laid the groundwork for how we market product today. Right. So clearly you are onto something. I'm also wondering how that process changed you. The, the first five years were like a blur. I guess it gave me this unbridled confidence to trust your intuition. And, mm. and basically you're out there selecting products and it's actually work. I mean, even if you look at DWR right now, it's like many of the products that we picked the first time are still there. What I was good at was assembling really talented people and being a conduit. We created like this designer biographies and behind every product I said there was a person and would identify their biographies. Rather than it being like a lifestyle company, it was more like, here's a collection of products that are made by people and behind every product, there's a person behind it. So I think that very close personal connection with designers themselves was a really important part of, of what we were doing in our kind of educational underpinnings for the business. 
I would agree with that. I remember paying attention at the time. So 1999, I would have been an art student. And that was a time when I was really aware of who was making what and what, you know, movie directors I liked. And I I also thought it was just so strange that we only knew a few names in design. We just knew Eames and Frank Gehry. And I was like, why are all these products out in the world and we don't know who made them and nobody's really talking about it except for art students? It was really important and I think meaningful for a design student. I was studying furniture design at the time to see somebody recognizing the designer behind the design. So I really appreciate that. And I think as humans, we do all want that connection. Right. We want to know where stuff comes from and why it's made and who's passionate about making it. (laughs) Yeah. And I think there, there was a lot of that going on in probably the 50s and 60s and 70s, I think that the major forces in design in the U.S., if you take the the two largest companies, which, which were Herman Miller and Knoll, they had really shifted to doing contract work. It was about workstations and office and cubicles, and they had moved away from the home, and they had taken their focus off of a lot of the great products and things that we ended up resurrecting and bringing these things back because no one had really paid much attention to them before, and no one was citing the authors behind them. They might credit Florence and all the people that were leading the businesses, the credit wasn't really given to the designers. Did you find that was important because you had a sense that the market would respond to it or because you just had a sense that it was important because you were yourself a, a maker? I think a lot of that's true, but it's also when you're writing copy, we worked really hard on, on making the copy accurate and truthful. And it wasn't like, here's a beautiful sofa, which will improve any living room. No, you would talk about the principles of the designer behind them. And, and where their values came from. And, and it was just a, a real honest description of what things were rather than something that might be falsely romantic or excessive. Honoring the person behind it was super important. And, and also displaying a, a, a context for that because a lot of the people that you were sending these catalogs to in, on the website, they wouldn't know who Alvar Alto was. It was they wouldn't know the, who Mies van der Rohe was or they probably wouldn't know the Eames and the Gucci's. It was, the educational part of this was super important. Since then, you have founded Public Bikes as well. And with both of those businesses in your repertoire and in your rearview mirror, I'm wondering like, what lessons you've taken with you that continue to inform your process and your passion? Maybe humility at the beginning of it, because DWR was so recklessly successful. I wanted to start a a small design business that I could make a living from and change my life in that direction. But it took off so much that it was like, oh my God, public bikes, which I started because of my belief in looking at the enlightened urbanization movement and really interested in getting people to reduce their a dependency on automobiles, stay collected at their communities. There was this huge movement all over in, in, in Europe in terms of the enlightened city centers and all that, and that was part of it. But it was really, again, to get people to think differently about the way that they lived and appreciate the things around them. And it was really hard. So Public Bikes was like eight years struggling to make a business work. It, public Bikes is, is still around. We, we sold it, and I love seeing the bikes around and stuff, but it was like one super success, one other meh, struggling just to get by. And out of that, you recognize that there's so much luck and timing and serendipity to the ventures that we start, particularly startups, that you're a little odd. And in some way, like I said, it makes you just feel humble and lucky. So you have these kind of successful, although arduous endeavors that you've participated in, that you were passionate about, that you were on the forefront of cultural movements with both of them. It sounds like you realize there's a lot of things that are outside of your control. Does it make you reticent to start again, knowing how arduous it can be? Does it help you to identify when the serendipitous things are coming together and then pounce and make your move? Or does it help you appreciate the concert of things that have to come together and when it's your turn to step in and participate in that concert? If we go back 30 years or when I was involved in upscale, especially the retailing and DWR and all that, we really learned how to market stuff in the U.S. Like the problem that I was trying to solve it, well, it's hard to gain access to stuff. Now everybody has access to everything. And like the world doesn't really need another chair. If you're a designer, designing a new chair is a good idea. But it became really one of, at this point in my life, saying, oh, what can you do? What need can we fill that hasn't been met yet? And this is if you're a retailer, because huh, I don't know what material objects we really need. There's mm-hmm. people jumped on technology, and that's leading us to things being smarter and faster and all that stuff. But it was what capabilities do I have 
where if I apply the highest and best use of my mind and my experience can actually help improve the world that we live in. And I don't say that as a philanthropist, it's just simply what problems can we solve now that, that aren't about a designer lifestyle. It's really thinking that the world is confusing and messed up in many ways, politically, environmentally, and socially, and all that. So it's how can we use the disciplines and the tools and the community that we've built to do something of purpose? And that also happens to you know, when you get a little older. It's like, well, what can I do now that has some meaning? That sort of leads the way to what you're doing now. Can you talk to me about the Studio 5050 project that you founded in 2021? Yeah, in the middle of the pandemic and with the uh, George Floyd murder and the Black Lives Matter movement, I was profoundly affected by that. And at different times in my life when I've been stuck about what should I do, I have a pretty good community of people whose ideas I respect and uh, will answer emails. And I just published in my, from my Studio Forbes website a confessional like, hey, what is an older white guy that knows a bit about design and raising money? Has anybody got any ideas how I can apply myself to helping solving this social problem? And I got a lot of feedback and like within a, f- a few weeks, I had identified through friends and colleagues, six small businesses around the country that we could support. And I hired a, a PA and started just going at it, just essentially getting to know and mentor um, small businesses run by people of color around the country. So there's a you know s- sneaker um, boutique in, in Columbus and, and one in Detroit, a uh, cosmetic stylist in LA and different eclectic businesses where we got engaged, you know, meeting weekly or bi-weekly on Zoom technologies around so you can get to know people great distances quite effortlessly and personally. The clients that, that we had came to us quickly and we've been working on that for the last year. And we're at this point right now of saying, uh, it's still very much a work in progress. I've recognized certain areas where we add a lot of value Also recognizing that for me, it probably needs to be shifted to a stronger design focus just so the experiences that I have can be more realized. Uh, It's like launching any startup. You don't know where it's going and you have to fumble around and change direction at different times in order to make it sustainable. Can you give me a sense of what the organization looks like currently? I mean, you mentioned you've got a, a handful of businesses owned and run by people of color, and it sounds like a handful of volunteers that you're working with, and you're sh- shifting it towards more of a design focus. And what kind of assistance are you offering, and what are those exchanges like? Are you sensing that it's having an impact, and where's it growing? Some of the clients that we work for, things have been great. Small businesses run by people that are retailers, so I get that stuff. For the businesses where I don't have experience, these are really super small businesses, you know, mom and pop groups. I have weaknesses in the areas of logistics and systems and how to make businesses really efficient. You know, I'm more a marketing, storytelling kind of guy. We're looking at casting out a net to field some people that more fall into that category, just where our experiences can apply. We're not exactly sure we're in the, okay, well, let's take a breather now and, and collect information from friends, talk to more people, do some more interviews, and think that how can we really make this? Oh, what I've learned also is that I'm not so adept in running organizations that involve a lot of management. We have 10 volunteers that work for us, but the logistics and complications behind that are serious. That means hiring somebody who can actually do that so I can work more on the creative ends rather than the logistic ends. It sounds to me like you're still cultivating it. You're iterating and course correcting and adapting as you go and figuring out what this needs to be and how you can serve it, but also where you need to complement your strengths with things that you're not as strong at. Th- this sounds a little bit like the, the place you get in the process where it's a lot more like tailoring and the results are maybe not as immediate. And so how do you keep yourself sustained and motivated through this stage of growth? It's a work in progress and we're really in this, let's rethink this period. That's a part of what I do because I also manage this little little micro farm business up in Healdsburg, because I enjoy writing, because I've always got a design project going on. I've got a lot of different things going on. And I've taken that one off of the front burner to the rear burner to say, okay, let's figure out what our next steps will be and then start whether we're raising money or recruiting other people, but just shift the mission to something that we believe is is more sustainable and where we can be the absolute best at it. 
you know, I've got discussions with some of the, my black friends who are designers kind of say, can you help me think how I can get more involved, how I can vote my resources more to something where we can both see the tangible results. When you change careers and when you try doing something that's new, it's hard. It's really like a, a new venture. And my commitment and, my, and a belief that in order to move us all forward, I think we in design have to shift from the lifestyle stuff to something that actually is contributing to improvements in our cultural world and our economic world and our societal world. So Without a doubt. Sometimes we don't see that. But when, when you go into new areas, it's a little daunting. Underneath this, the fact that, you know, by getting to know people and making friends and saying, hey, there's some optimism in our goofy world by doing this. We can build some bridges between cultures that aren't there. So I suppose the advantage of having done what, one, two, three startups before is that you recognize, OK, try some stuff. If it's working, if the dogs are eating the dog food, then you go that way. If not, put it on the rear burner, go and gather information and come back at it with a new sense of, of purpose and intelligence. So in terms of finding that purpose and intelligence, I want to ask about your creative process. You've talked a bit about the micro farm. And after talking to you, I see you as somebody who not only appreciates form and aesthetics, but you're clearly a storyteller and a a marketer person, as you've said. But it sounds to me like you're a systems thinker as well and a problem solver. You've built startups from the ground up. So you're a grower of platforms. Is there an overlay? Can you draw direct parallels between what you're doing at the micro farm and food systems and how you look at the ecosystems and your creative process? I'm not sure if I can, if it's as lofty as that. I okay. Call, I, <laughs> okay. I, bring it back down to earth. <laughs> I call it a micro farm because it's an acre and a half. It's not a garden. And Miriam, who manages the farm, does all the work. We raise vegetables there and fruits and and. We supply restaurants in Hillsburg and also in San Francisco. I'm there supplying soil and light and water and resources, but she really does that. I've always been pretty deep and studied a little horticulture as an undergraduate by working at Williams Sonoma. Maybe a third of my friends are in the culinary arts. So it's more probably a survival tactic of, of how do you do something where you love what you do and you're good at it. But I think recognizing that, let's say, how a small farm can be a legitimate part of the ecosystem of farm to table and all that, it's really a good assignment. You really learn a lot about that stuff. And if if you haven't been a farmer, understanding how stuff changes seasonally and and the risks and and rewards of all that kind of stuff, it's less, I suppose, strategic than something that you enjoy doing that has value. And I'm an okay problem solver, not so much on, on logistics and the details and the systems and technology behind that, but I like reducing complex problems and, and making them simple or, or let's say assisting a in, in kind of figuring out what of the things that we're growing really make sense and how to differentiate that stuff. And, and some of the things that you just learned being a purveyor of, ch- of chairs or bikes or anything else. What is it that you love about the micro farm? If somebody else is in the soil, like doing all the work, as you said, what is it about it that you love? I think the connection to nature. I I cook a lot. And when you've got your own fresh herbs that you're using instead of dry herbs, and and just the the ways in which you adapt what you're cooking to what you have right around you, I don't know, all that stuff is just fun. I entertain a fair amount and really enjoy doing that. And having chefs and people come by and, and who can go out the garden and pick things and cook them up. It's more, I suppose, just a way of living that I enjoy that helps me stay connected with my community and the people that I really like. When we look at our food systems now, we're so disconnected from our food, but we're also maybe not even using our food systems in the way that you are. I'm interested in the way that you felt you could take what you're interested in and then build it into something that then supports a life you're interested in living. And that may seem really obvious, but it's not so obvious to a lot of people. So I wonder if you can break that down, maybe distill that down into something really simple. I'm a very lucky person that can live in San Francisco and also have a second home that's a micro farm, right? So it's not an example of how other people can live. I think that we forget that the world that we live in, everybody and their brother now is a foodie. But this is all really recent. Early, even the early 90s in the Bay Area, there were only a handful of restaurants that were doing farm-to-table stuff. 
and the, the way in which restaurants and the food supply is being changed, we are a huge leader in the organic food movement in, in California. It's been a big deal. And participating in that in a super changing kind of environment, these are like the early days of figuring out how we can make agricultural that's not industrial sustainable. So I feel like I'm part of that group of people that are working to make it happen. I'm lucky enough to be in the middle of it on, on both sides without professing to having any great knowledge. I mean, the friends of mine are people that, know that really run highly productive farms. That's a whole different business. Getting that stuff to the, to the market and employing staffs of people and dealing with all the complexity with nature and the seasonality of stuff. There's a reason why Warren Buffett is always saying, I never invest in agriculture because it's difficult. It's not like industrial design where if you produce something, get it right, you can scale it up really quickly. Stuff changes. And when you think about the changing environment that we have in Northern California with the fires and global warming, this is very much a moving target. Thinking about what you just said and all of the, the variables and things that you have to consider in terms of just growing food and getting it out to people, what does it teach us about the distribution of resources in the built world? You're doing a little bit of the same with Studio 5050. I'm really interested in figuring out sustainable restaurant business with a new model that is not like the old world of high-level fine dining. The system that exists now really benefits scale. And if you're small scale, how do you make that work? I'm not sure. But some of the new concepts that deal with a much more simplified menu or Mm -hmm. the prefix stuff, or instead of a menu that's got a million different things, how do we maintain a small amount of inventory and fewer staff, but make it really efficient and clever and smart and and attractive to people? So I think there's a maybe a sense of economy in that and also supporting groups that are controlling their whole supply chain, but on a level that's affordable to a larger group of people, like I have zero interest in there's Michelin star restaurants. Those things are humming along of their own vibe, but trying to figure out how we deliver quality stuff to a broader group of people is a really interesting challenge. And those things excite me. So if somebody came along with, here's a concept to do that, I would be all in and figuring out how to support them and how to develop this stuff and how we scale it because you're doing something that you know benefits the local community. It doesn't involve some of the complexities of shipping stuff all across the country and all the packaging and complexity and all that stuff. But I, I haven't got there yet. And I think a lot of us are trying to figure that out. Yeah. How do you templatize something that works in a hyper-local setting that you can then repurpose and, and tailor to other hyper-local settings? But I still feel very much like a student in most things that I'm doing. I'm still learning a lot of stuff and and probably have more questions than answers. And in our complex world, and I think the last, I don't know, five or six years, the different stuff that's been thrown at us culturally and politically and environmentally leaves us all saying, okay, let's put our heads together and figure out how to do something that has meaning. It might be that, that living in San Francisco, because design has been a little bit co-opted by the technology world. So if you say design here, it's it's basically about innovation and change and web. It's all this fast moving change, change, change. That kind of stuff. Also, part of that is working on the other side of the equation, which is what is sustainable and what has quality and what is meaningful on a touch and feel and sensory basis. So you mentioned that you're probably more of a student um, than an expert in a lot of ways. Is that by choice? Obviously, we're in a time where a lot of us have a lot of learning to do, but have you always been pulling yourself into areas where you're not the expert so that you can be on a learning curve? Is that your comfort zone? I think it's my maybe my curiosity. You really have to be nuts to try to like do a startup where you don't have expertise in the area. You've got to sell people on an idea and and you haven't really done it before. And so I've always been game enough to try to do that. I don't think of myself as being a wildly creative guy because no, no, are because I'm willing to take risks and try things that haven't been done. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work. But it's really probably my DNA is more a willingness to go places that I haven't been because I find it super interesting. So what haven't I asked that you want to talk about? I'm still figuring stuff out. Like I said, when I have more questions than answers, that's probably true. Let's say, for example, like I'm I'm on the board of the Noguchi Foundation, Mm -hmm. and it's one of the few boards I've been on. I don't like committee meeting all this, but I'm really helpful in that group because we're figuring out how to really improve and assist and expand. There are our Akari lighting segment 
and applying the skills that I have in retail towards really creating greater awareness for a super important artist that I think deserves more recognition, all that. But I can apply my skill sets to an organization and do stuff tactically. That makes me happy. I'm assisting the museum in Healdsburg on a whole new program to establish its identity and to become like a statewide kind of destination culturally. Those things really give me a lot of pleasure and I feel like my, my skill set can apply itself to you know, these institutions, these little groups that can benefit by a greater exposure. It's really important when you feel like all of the expertise you've accumulated, all of the lived experience you have to offer, and all of the sort of curiosity and interest you have can be channeled towards something that you believe in and will outlive you and your energy is being utilized in a worthwhile way right. as opposed to being squandered. That's sometimes hard for us to recognize at what point what we have is something of value. <laughs> right. Especially if you're a lifelong student, because you can always kind of think of yourself as a novice if everything's new and you're learning it. So at some point you have to recognize, hey, wait, this life of being a lifelong learner means I have learned a lot of stuff and other people can use this. And I want to go participate in those collaborative environments where... What I've done is now going to yield positive results in some other way. Maybe a micro e example of that. I like to, to write. I'm a slow writer, but I enjoy that process. But I wrote a little article about visiting this restaurant in Mexico City a little over a month and a half ago, and it's on my Studio Forbes website. But it's an example of walking into a restaurant, being by myself and looking around at the design and the, the whole meaning of this restaurant and how that is perceived through the lens of, of design and food and all that. But just a lot of people read that and said, Rob, that's really good. That's what you do well. But this is something that's really giving credit to the people behind the restaurant and the designer behind it and all that stuff. It is something where I can be a proponent or be a positive force um, looking at a restaurant through uh, a unique or a design-focused lens. Mm -hmm. You're sort of an advocate. An advocate. Way. There we go. There's a good word. Just to wrap this up, can you share something personal with me? It can be something, a, a hidden talent, something people don't know about you, or even just your favorite thing to do to anchor yourself every day. Oh, favorite thing to do anchoring, the two specific things. One are long walks with my dog. I have a little yoga practice, meditation practice to keep my mind from, from messing with, but long walks with my dog. And then I prepare food every day. And, and that's a, a love and an activity and a therapy and something that takes me to a place that's super both relaxing and smart and experimental and, and all that. But that's really, I suppose, my dog and my uh, connection with uh, food and my friends that participate in the kitchen and eating activities are at the top of that list. Well, that sounds like a rich life. Thank you for sharing your story with me. Thanks. I know I, and I appreciate what you guys are doing. I, I like the fact that, that Clever, you guys focus on a, a broad range of designers and, and you look at design from a broad point of view. So I think that's terrific. Hey, thanks for listening. To see images of Rob and his work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We also love chatting with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is hosted and produced by me, Amy Devers, with editing by Rich Straffolino, production assistance from Alana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. 